sort of talk about uh, some of the work that we've been doing since 2011, create some, um, present some case studies and also talk about a new initiative that we've just started in the summer of this year. And actually, they really show some of the thoughts that, we've, um, that were presented earlier on in the session. We, we're, we're doing it in practice. We are doing some of this work up in Scotland. So it's really lovely to see some of the similar themes um, come up and appear. But I'll do a rapid run through of um, who we are and where we're from. Um, I work at Archaeology Scotland and we're the main heritage charity um, in Scotland um, for community heritage. And we work to inspire communities, amateurs and professionals to discover, explore and enjoy their past. And I hope that we do a good job of it. I think we do. We have some amazing initiatives um, that we work with. Um, we cover the whole of Scotland from Shetland down to Dumfries and Galloway. Um, we do Scottish Archaeology Month. Um, we have a very active learning department that is going into schools and helping schools use archaeology to deliver the curriculum of excellence up in schools. Um, in Scotland, um, and we also have a group of uh, achievement certificate scheme called Heritage Hero Awards, um, which is proving really, really popular up north as well, but I'll come on to that. So I joined in um, 2011 um, to work on the Adopt a Monument scheme, and it's one of the sort of flagship initiatives of Archaeology Scotland, although I would say that. Um, it's been running since 1991, and for 27 years we've been supporting communities um, to conserve and promote um, monuments and heritage in their local areas. Um, but in 2011, we were successfully awarded a substantial HLF grant um, that was um, match funded by the then Historic Scotland, um, and which really enabled us to sort of build the capacity of the team. So we want, went from really one sort of part-time person to three people. And we were funded to work with 55 groups throughout Scotland. Um, Going back, one of the most important aspects of our projects um, is that they are community-led. So the community comes to us with the type of heritage that they're interested in engaging with, and we help facilitate their project. We'll help them get permissions, um, funding, um, we'll help give them training. But the idea is it's their heritage, and we just help them engage with it. You'll note there that we've got an increase in numbers. We got a bit of additional funding to extend the project into 2017. So we ended up um, working with 71 groups throughout Scotland. We were only meant to do 20 training workshops, and we ended up doing 79, which was just idiocy. So I don't know how that happened, but it did. Um, and these are the huge types of sites that um, our groups are interested in. And as you can see, there's a huge range of heritage. Matt brought that up um, earlier, that we really have to be jack of all trades and master of none. We need to know a little bit about everything, or at least then gem up before the first initial meeting to pretend that we know something about everything. Um, or, actually, what's really nice is you get to a site and the community will tell you about their site, which is a really, really lovely, um, lovely thing to do. But a big part of um, this new phase of the project was to widen heritage audiences. And of those 55 groups, 15 um, projects were designated to be to develop new heritage audiences. Um, and these were, these were identified through, I suppose, audiences that weren't engaging with their local heritage, they weren't taking part in heritage activities, they weren't represented within um, a heritage professional. Um, and again, looking at those diversity issues that Kevin brought up before. So we were really greatly inspired by the um, Gloucester Council archaeologists, some of the work that they were doing, and also Rachel Kiddies, PhD on homeless heritage. Um, and I met um, Rachel in the 2010 tag in Bristol and met some of her, the individuals that were working with her with her PhD. They, were, they had an exhibition showing their, um, uh, the excavation they did of homeless heritage in the middle of Bristol. And again, it just really sort of brought on ideas and really made us think, we want to do this in Scotland. How can we do this in Scotland? So we had um, fantastic funding to do our 15 projects, and our first project was Digging the Seam. Um, this was a partnership project with um, Crisis Skylights Edinburgh, um, and it was sort of set up to record elements of Edinburgh Old World Heritage Site. My biggest learning curve with this project was actually over data acquisition. As archaeologists, you are trained from an early age that your sole reason on site is to do data acquisition. 
And actually, these projects aren't about that. These projects are about putting the people at the centre of the project. These projects are designed around the audience that you want to engage with, that you want to work with. So we still collected some really valuable baseline data on this project, um, but we didn't create, um, collect as much as I had originally hoped for. But we did have amazing um, participants that kept coming back week on week on week to do the workshops with us over about four months. And this project had legs. We ended up doing two further projects with Crisis Skylight Edinburgh, and we've got another one in the planning as well. So it's a really lovely partnership that is just continuing through the years. But learning from digging the scene, um, we started, we created a new project called Women at War. And this was in partnership with Rothschild Women's Aid. It was set up in the Highlands. Um, and we got a bit more funding to make sure that we were completely resource to enable anyone to come out with us out on site. So we got a bit of extra funding that could pay for food, transport costs, um, outdoor clothing, childcare costs, to ensure that everyone could keep coming to workshops, that no one um, was able to not take part in the project because they couldn't afford to get there, for example, they couldn't afford their petrol or things like that. So we made sure we were really well resourced with that. Um, and we set about recording a World War II airbase. Um, Rothschild's Women's Aid were already doing weekly workshops with their participants, um, which included looking at gender identity um, in uh, modern society. So we took that theme and applied it to our World War II airbase. We um, went out and we looked at the gender identity of the Rens who were served out on site and we started surveying the buildings to see if we could see that archaeologically. So we're linking those sort of modern day themes um, and linking it back to the archaeology. And we got some really, really lovely outcomes um, for this. We did um, a lot of work. We did a lot of survey work, oral history, archive collection, um, and um, we've got leaflets and web content. Um, but really it's about the people and what they got out of it. And um, what we began to hear from our staff, from the staff um, from Rothschild's Women's Aid, was that the participants were becoming more confident. They were starting to take the lead with um, activities in other projects that they were taking part in. Um, they were um, volunteering information about this project, but also other projects. And I, sh I haven't got enough, um, a lot of time to talk about this project, but you have to think about the individuals we're working in. They've often come out of exceptionally traumatic experiences. They were, um, you know, dealing with lots of mental health issues um, and their confidence was really, really quite at rock bottom. One of our participants um, had been relocated to this new area for um, safety. She was really proud of the area that she had grown up in and she'd had to leave that area because she had to leave her abusive partner. And she said taking part in Women at War allowed her to explore her new area, allowed her to um, see what local heritage was available to her to engage with. And for me, that was, that was just a really powerful sort of um, feedback from the project. What better reason are we to be out on site doing these projects if you can help someone um, feel more at home in their new home? It was a really, really great, great project. And we saw these um, outcomes with the smaller scale ones um, that we delivered as well, where, you know, even if we just had a, a day workshop with children who were living in care, even just taking them around the Antonine walls, um, letting them handle Samian wear, um, you could still see the benefits from engaging just for a couple of hours of escapism, um, allowing them, um, well, not allowing them, enabling them um, and supporting them to explore their local heritage that was right on their doorstep. So... In, we finished that project, um, excuse me, or rather our HLF funding finished in 2011, um, and we were fortunate that Historic Environment Scotland continued our funding for Adopt a Monument, so we were able to um, continue supporting the 71 groups that we were working with, and we were able to take on um, about five to ten new groups a year. Um, so our, our list is ever growing, we've still got about 18 um, traditional community groups on a waiting list for Adopt a Monument, we've got plans to address that. Um, but alongside um, sort of Adopt coming to an end, we'd also been working with Scottish Waterways Trust on their Canal College Employability Scheme since 2014. So as an organisation, 
we'd started developing skills of delivering heritage activities to support participants to gain employability skills. Um, and with this project, 72% um, of the participants went on to a positive destination. And that positive destination could be a job, further training, or a new um, training course. Um, and it worked with 16 to 24 year olds. Um, so they left school, they didn't really know what they wanted to do. They came and did an 11 week course of which three weeks was archeology. span And as I say, 70% of our participants went on to do something else. Again, really, really great um, outcomes. So with this, we thought we knew that we were having an impact with our work. We knew that we were having some really great outcomes, but we also knew that we just needed to actually have a, fun, a project where we could start to refine our methodologies. We could start to really think about how we're doing these projects, what questions are we asking, and how are we going to get the evidence to prove that we are having an impact with our work, with our engagement. So out of that came attainment through archaeology. Um, and this commenced in July 2018, and we're really fortunate we've got funding from Historic Environment Scotland and the Robertson's Trust to do this work. Um, we do need more funding to do um, a lot of the fieldwork elements that we want to do, but we are actively pursuing that. And we've just completed our first five-week course. The initiative or the project is aimed at areas of um, high, the, um, high areas of multiple deprivation in Scotland. And the idea is to support 11 to 26 year olds um, to use heritage to develop um, key transferable skills to get onto a positive destination. So what's really exciting about the funding is that we not only have the funding to actually go out and deliver, but this funding is also allowing us to, as I say, develop product frameworks, develop capacity within our organisation, train up our staff to do these projects, um, and again, allow us to test our methodologies. And it's all feeding into national strategies like Scotland's archaeology strategy, our place in time, um, which are our heritage policy document, um, and also wider Scottish government initiatives like the Scottish Attainment Challenge. And these sort of larger um, sort of strategy drivers are really up there with what we are trying to, to address, what we're trying to link our work to. Um, so we've just finished our first five-week project called Exploring Old Ockenleck, um, and that worked with existing and new project partners. And our project partners identified an audience of young people who were regularly absent from school. Um, so it was in East Ayrshire. Um, we worked with 14 to 16-year-olds, and the idea was that we would become a flexible work placement for these young people for five weeks. They were, um, as I say, they weren't regularly attending school, um, but they came out with us to do um, various activities. So these are the sort of activities that we did. Um, 11 people took part, um, and there was sporadic attendance, but what was really nice is that some people would miss a week, but then they'd come back the next week, so that we had a lot of people coming back and taking part in the project. Um, oh, there we go. Um, and these, so as I say, these are the, um, the, skill, the um, activities that we did these are the skills that we, um, that our participants, our young people, demonstrated they, um, they were capable of when they were doing these tasks, which will hopefully, and has, led to them sticking with their next work placement. So the idea is that, that our work would help prepare them for that next um, work experience placement that was actually a bit more linked to maybe what they wanted to do in life. And it's, it can't be um, underestimated the value of learning how to do timekeeping. At the start of the project, some of them had atrocious timekeeping that would probably be sacked on the second day of their job if they kept turning up three hours late for things. Um, it wasn't that late. But, um, but what was really great, by the end of the project, they learned that they had to be there on 10 or they'd miss all the donuts. They, they, they really did um, develop some really great skills, experiences um, throughout the project. And what's really nice is about seven or eight of the participants have signed up, as I say, to go on to their next work placement. Um, I'm running out of time, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, impact. And we are, oh, those are some of our results there. We are, are we having an impact? I absolutely believe that we are having an impact, but that we need to develop new frameworks and methods for testing this. Um, for anyone doing this um, sort of work, I'd really recommend that you check out Evaluation Support Scotland. 
They have a lot of resources on their website that are free, downloadable to use, and they can allow you to test um, and collect the data that you need to see if you are having an impact. So for this project, we had um, an evaluation framework in place right at the start. We did observational data collection throughout the whole process. And through that, we could actually measure positive change in our participants. So we could see, I laughed and joked about timekeeping, but you could actually see that improving throughout the time. You could measure um, increase, um, uh, increases in eye, making eye contact, increased confidence, um, initiative, things like this. And it was all just, we knew that we were getting those impacts, but just by recording it in a more systematic way, we, we, I think we, we can stand up a bit better in court to show that archaeology can be useful to young people. The proof in the pudding will be um, whether this is a sustainable impact. And I'm planning to follow up with these participants in six months and in a year's time to see if they are still on the, um, they're engaged with school and engaged with work placements. I'm certainly not expecting them all to be positive stories at all, but the fact is that through our evaluation framework, we will be going back to see if we are having that impact. So where next? We've got another two and a half years of attainment through archaeology. Um, so we've got um, a quite a lot of work that we want to do throughout Scotland. We've got a 10 week project hopefully taking place in Dundee starting next spring. And we've got lots of taster sessions set, um, set up with various project partners as well. Um, we're hoping though as an organisation, and I think we already are, is we're integrating this type of work far more into the, our mainstream activities. Um, and a doctor monument, the next phase of a doctor monument is going to have a much more integrated approach. We're not going to separate out the projects, I think, like we did in 2011. Um, and as I say, this integrated approach is also being repeated by my colleagues throughout um, the organisation. This is the direction of travel. Um, and I firmly believe that we should be doing these projects, we are having an impact and that we, well, we should be doing it. It should be a consideration for all the type of work that we are doing. Thank you. Thank you.